Hello everybody and welcome to this unboxing. In this one we're going to be checking out the Kasserine two-player starter box for Flames of War. Uh, this has a lot of stuff in it, very ideal for two new players to come to the game or two experienced players to just try a couple of different armies. In the Kasserine box we have the German Africa Corps and the American Armored Forces as well. So we have a nice range of Shermans, M3 Stuarts, M3 Lees, uh, Panzer 3s, Panzer 4s, and a few anti-tank guns as well. So without further ado, let's go and open it up. So here we have our Kasserine box, our Americans versus German. We have 21 tanks and three guns, as it says so on the box. So let's crack it open. And we are met with an absolute storm of sprues. We have our dark green stuff, which is all our American vehicles. We have our yellow stuff, which is all the Germans. And we have crew sprues for both the German and the American vehicles, as well as gun crews for the German anti-tank guns that come in the box. So let's move this crew sprues and stuff out of the way here. We'll move the box to one side. We'll get some of these sprues out of the way here and we'll start looking uh, at the paperwork first. So we have this stuff and this. So we have a little core rules pamphlet. Gives you all the basics that you need to get going. Very handy to have. I always hold on to these when we get the two player boxes in. They're just nice little quick reference sheets. So we'll move that out of the way. In here we have our unit cards and our rule book. So move that bag out of the way. So the rule book, if you guys are familiar with Flames of War, you get these absolutely everywhere. You get them in the two player starter boxes and you get them in the army boxes as well. And they're full color, A5 size, have everything you need. And in general, these are just some of the handiest resources that Battlefront give away with the Flames of War game. The fact that every time you buy a box, one of these is in there in case you misplace it. Or, you know, like me, you like to make little um, rule book forts out of stuff because you have so many of them because you review so much of their stuff over uh, over the years and um yeah it's it's always a handy resource because you can stick these in a bag or whatever and you can completely forget about them and if you think you've forgotten a book it's there's probably one floating around not too far away onto our stat cards and as you'll know uh i believe it was was it the first mid-war boot camp we did was African campaign for the version four of the game. So a lot of this stuff will be familiar uh, to anyone that has seen some of our stuff before on it, particularly the boot camp, any old attendees that remember that. And you know what the stat cards are now if you're if you're uh, familiar with Flames of War. If you're not familiar with Flames of War, this is how you math hammer in Flames of War. You just take your cards, look at what they tell you you can have, base that on what you have in your box, and you're going to be building armies really easily, really effectively. And I quite like the tactile nature of, of army building with the card decks. Just laying it all out, going, right, there's my formation commander, there's the platoons that go with him, here's the support, slot that in there as well. And it gives you a very visual representation of your army before you've even built anything, potentially. So always good to know. I'll move that out of the way. Then we have the instruction sheet which is covering in this front one here, the Stuart and the Sherman. And then we have the German stuff as well there. So including the gun, the Panzer three and four. And on the back, we have the M3 Lee. So that as well. Now, anything else paper wise we want to talk about? There's also dice, nice colored dice that go with the, the two forces and the bases, a couple of infantry bases there. I'm not too sure what they're for. There probably should be artillery bases in there for the guns. Yeah. Anyway, let's have a look at the sprues themselves. So let's start with the Panzer IV. So we have all the parts we need on a single sprue. Upper hull, lower hull, tracks, bits and bobs, all parts for the turret, back of the uh, hull, the engine bay, that sort of stuff. We have a couple of gun options here. In fact, there should be three guns uh, on this sprue. There is. So we have... The longer, which is sort of what I would say is the late war uh, version of the 75 millimeter. Uh, then we have this one here, which is sort of for the F2 special, the one that we would you would see more frequently in the desert. And then across here, we have the barrel 
uh, for the short 75. This is the uh, infantry support version of the Panzer IV, mostly used to fire high explosives and stuff like that. I rode along with the infantry a lot more uh, than the ones with the longer barrels. So a pretty easy kit to build. We, I've built many of these over the years. Nicely laid out on the sprue. Once you've built one using the instruction book, you have a reference miniature. You can go ahead and build the, the other ones uh, in the box as well. Pretty straightforward. Nothing too complicated there at all. Uh, if you feel being feel like you're a bit more creative, you can get probably get some magnets in there uh, to change the guns out or whatever you feel like. A little bit of creativity gets you a lot of mileage out of a kit this easy. So we'll move that to the side. And we'll then bring in probably what is my favorite tank out of this whole box really is the Panzer III. Because Panzer III's get a rap later on in the war for not being that effective, but through various upgrade programs, they became better and better. And about as, as good as you could make a vehicle that has a, a sort of a 50 millimeter anti-tank gun. But then as you can see down here on the gun sprue, they also gave it the short 75 as well helping with that infantry support idea that they had, uh, particularly out in the desert when infantry really needed some intimate tank support and Panzer III's and early model Panzer IVs were able to, to give them that. Over here as well, we have the short 50 millimeter gun down here at the bottom of the sprue and the long 50 millimeter gun as well. Getting kind of a choice between the two of them. I reckon that more often than not, we would start to see the long barrel 50s coming in, uh, particularly towards the end when the Americans were getting involved um, in the North African campaign, then moving on into Italy. So all in all, another good little kit, very sturdy, been around for a few years, plenty of options that give you, again, lots of mileage out of a single kit. Next, we're going to see the anti-tank gun, which is the Pac-38. This is a 50 millimeter anti-tank gun, essentially the same gun as uh, the long version on the Panzer III. And Yep, just a bunch of small parts. Again, nothing too complicated here. I like that they've integrated the legs and the, sh the carriage in there, so all you really need to do is stick the wheels on and then just glue the gun shields and whatnot on as well. So again, you don't want to be thinking too long and spending a lot of time hobbying when you could be having games with this stuff. So that's fine. And then to wrap our German stuff up, I'll just peel, peel them apart because they're stuck together. Uh, we have a sprue for uh, tank commanders and vehicle commanders. So, you know, we've seen those before, as well as our German gun crew as well. I'm not going to take them out of the bag. These are soft, sort of a, a softer resiny uh, material. I quite like the detail that they get out of these miniatures. I think they're a little bit nicer than the, the standard plastics, but that's just my opinion. So that covers our German stuff. Let's have a look at our American stuff. Of course, I'm going to start with a Sherman. <laughs> this is the M4, one of the early model Shermans. And uh, as you can tell, an early model Sherman generally uh, due to a lot of casting being used in the construction process. So a cast hull uh, is one of the bigger giveaways of an early model. I like that on this kit, the by machine gun appears to already be in situ. So it, it it's removing a small awkward part from the sprue that you usually would probably find that your carpet monster would eat pretty quick. Now, there are plenty of options on this. This, this tank, uh, this model gets a fair bit of mileage out of it. It has two nose options. We have the three piece nose and the single piece nose. From what I know, from what I understand without opening any books straight away, I know that I feel that the three piece nose is the early casting is the early version of the transmission design and that later on the single piece came into service. I'm not sure when. I'd need to open my Honeycut book and check that out. Same with the gun mantlet. You have two gun mantlets here available, but one is already integrally attached onto the gun, which is this narrow mantlet, which again denotes a fairly early model Sherman. Later on, they added this wider mantle that increased the, the frontal turret armor a little bit a bit more protection in that area because the armor is just a wee touch thinner on the front face of the turret because of uh, space constrictions and stuff like that. Uh, apart from that, it's a pretty standard uh, Sherman model. And yeah, again, you're going to get a bit of mileage out of this, not as much 
as you'd like. Uh, I know that the um, D-Day two-player starter had Shermans like this in here, but also had options for the 76mm gun uh, on a separate sprue. All in all, nice tidy kit, well designed, well laid out on the sprue. Everything's pretty obvious. You get spare 50 calibers because you will break one if you're a little bit ham-fisted when you're cutting them out. It happens to all of us. So that's our Sherman. Let's move that out of the way. And let's move on to the other big American, <clears throat> the other big American in the yard, the M3. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the M3 is really a stopgap vehicle. First sent to the British, the British absolutely loved it and then started basically trying to grab every single M3 they could off the Americans as they came off the production line. But as America was edging towards getting involved in the war, particularly after Pearl Harbor, they started to hold on to a few and started to stand up some regiments uh, while, again, waiting for Shermans to come online and be, be deployed. Now, M3, basically the lower hull of M3 is pretty much exactly what M4 uh, turned out to be a few modifications in the suspension units here. Nothing, nothing too drastic. Again, you see this three-piece nose, uh, which has a little cut out of one side of it to allow the sponson gun, which was where the 75 millimeter was mounted on an M3, uh, you allowed that to traverse and you know, gives it enough room to muck around there without interfering with anything on the hull. A massive tank, absolutely huge, about 13 feet tall, um, just shy of 20 long, something like that. I can't remember the exact length. Now, moving on to the kit, this kit has a heck of a lot of mileage in it because M3s were basically, once they were done in Europe, they went over to the Pacific and served quite well in the Pacific. Uh, if you feel fancy, you can modify this into a recovery vehicle if you feel like it, make it a really cool looking objective perhaps. Um, but gameplay wise, we have the M3 and the Grant versions both on the same sprue. Now, the Grant is the British one, which has this turret instead of this turret. This turret allowed them to have a radio set up here so that the commander had easier access to communications, uh, but still feeling a little bit overloaded, in my opinion. There's just too much going on here. Uh, there's also two guns, two 75mm guns. There's the M3 gun, which I think think is probably this one and a shorter slightly shorter 75 an earlier model 75 as far as i'm aware don't quote me on that again i don't have uh, reference materials handy the curiosity of m3 is really the amount of machine guns that they wanted to put on it so <laughs> it had a coaxial 30 caliber next to the 37 millimeter in the turret it had a second turret for the commander's cupola which had another 30 caliber Earlier models had, well, it's actually modeled on this one as well, twin 30 calibers in the nose. And earlier models like the, the M2 medium and stuff like that had machine guns poking out the back as well. It, it was ridiculous. This felt like a Citadel, but a Citadel that wasn't really worth anything. Not until the British got their hands on it, basically saying, right, our Crusaders and Cruiser 3s aren't really doing the job anymore. So they get this and they have fun with it and they, it, it works very well for them. And then Shermans came online and started to be deployed and through Land Lease and stuff as well. Again, a very good kit, very tidy. It's something that we've seen before. It's been out for a few years, but it's always good to go back over a kit like this and just, I don't know, discuss a few different aspects of it. That will do for that one. We have one more and it's our little boy, our M3 Stuart. Some people call it a honey. Apparently it never was called a honey. That's, um, yeah, I'll, I'll listen to David Fletcher on that one. Um, small little light tank served very well again. This kit allows you to have several variations of it, probably the later model M3 and the earlier model M3. Difference is really going from this octagonal kind of shaped turret to this more rounded one, or maybe it's vice versa, one or the other. This will do, if you're a British player, this will do your British version as well as your American one. Don't ask me the differences. I don't know. They call it a honey on the sprue. Tut tut battlefront. You should know better than that. Um, I've not built one of these before. I've not worked with the, the M3 kit, so I'll probably have to get my hands uh, dirty with that at some point. Again, nice to see that the hull machine gun is an integral part on the upper hull as well, because... Again, guys, it's just another piece that you're going to lose at some point. 
Uh, we have a couple of gun options here. We have the 37 millimeter and we have, this, I believe this is a short 75 uh, for again, infantry support, or is it the flamethrower? You can let me know in the comments. A couple of 30 calibers, which go on top of the turret. Excellent uh, riveted detail as well. Riveting detail, if you will. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. And um, good detail on the suspension and tracks as well. Another charming little kit that should be fun to build. So there you have it. That is our look at the Casserine box. Now, a few opinions on this. Probably not going to be overly popular with some of the guys at Battlefront. I know they're probably going to send me angry messages or whatever. But it's just a little gripe that I want to point out. Um, the box is fine. No problems with the miniatures, of course. There is just nothing wrong with having Shermans in your life. Why wouldn't you want that? What is missing from this, or what I feel is missing from this, is something like a beginner scenario. Now, I know there's a quick start uh, guide in here as well, which isn't the biggest deal. I would like a little bit more history involved. I would like a, a little scenario of maybe not necessarily perhaps about Catherine Pass itself, as that was the big wake up call for the American army to look at their tactics and go, okay, there's a lot of things didn't work here. Let's try something different next time around. And they did, to be fair, they adapted. They had a few changes in their leadership and their officers. Uh, famously, Patton joined the fight after Catherine and uh, did a lot of interesting things there. However, I would like that represented a bit more in the box rather than it just being a German force and an American force uh, and then just casting uh, the name slapped over it. I, I think that's just a little thing that they could have uh, improved on. Um, I'm trying to think, is there, was there anything else really? Yes, there was. The D-Day um, two-player starter box is still, in my opinion, the finest two-player starter box that has come out on the, to the wargaming market, uh, particularly with plastic miniatures and stuff like that. I know there's other two-player sets out there that people would say is better. However, value for money and getting to grips with a game, uh, that that set had everything. And what's missing from Kasserine is infantry. And honestly, I would have taken infantry over some of the units uh, that are in the box. Uh, for example, let me have a look here. Just off the top of my head, I would probably have used or taken less Stuarts. I would have maybe halved that, you know, five down to three perhaps, or five down to two. And I would have included at least some kind of infantry unit in there. Um, same on the German side, I would have forego the anti-tank guns because you've got Panzer IVs. And I would have put some uh, DAC infantry in there. Um, but that's just my little gripe. It's what made the um, the two-player starter set for D-Day work so well and become such a very popular uh, box amongst new players and experienced players. It gives you a lot, uh, a lot of bang for its buck. And um, this doesn't quite give that same taste of the game. That's that's really all I have to say on it. It's not. It's good, but it's not. It's not that good. So overall, still a good box set. You're still getting plenty of miniatures in there. A new player is going to come to this box and still have a good experience with it. Absolutely no doubt in my mind at all. Anyway, that is my opinions. Please leave yours in the comments below. I'll be looking forward to reading them. And until next time, take care. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.